to welcome all of you coming in despite this horrible weather. <coughs> the gentleman we're going to hear is the first person in five years who actually is a Queens native. <laughs> to his great praise. And right. I went to high school, probably not more than a mile from Archbishop Malloy, right on Main Street, right, right. down the block. Yeah. That's where we used to live, right? right opposite Malloy. Ah, there you go. And uh, he knows the borough, which is really good for the hospital and for all of us. He is my new boss, the chief of internal medicine at the hospital, fresh from coming down from Royal Cornell. And uh, his expertise is in pulmonary disease and intensive care. Uh, again, try to hold your questions, raise your hands, and he will answer all your questions at the end. Write them down, it'll be even better. Dr. Joseph Cook is going to speak. Thank you very much. So, uh, so oh, hey, Andrew, just at the right? No, 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 no it's oh. over here. Just uh, whatever you just, I already started taping. Okay. Just wherever you stand, just make sure you can see yourself there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. I'll have to get accustomed to this. Well, thank you very much for inviting me tonight. It's a pleasure, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, I own, I've limited myself to 13 slides, uh, so I can leave lots of time for questions. And what I thought I'd do with this, with this uh, talk, if you will, is do what I, what I value the most when I have my patients in my office, is educate my patients, give them a little bit of background. <coughs> so I think it's always very helpful so they know from where I'm coming from so they can understand what I'm trying to ask of them. Uh, so I'm going to go over a little bit of normal function. We'll touch upon some of the common ailments of lung disease. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you a slide which has all my host of inhalers and things, and we can go through each one of them if you would like. So the normal lungs, okay, has anybody seen a pair of lungs? Up on the upper left here, oh, sorry. Oh, what the I middle doing? one is the point there. The middle one. Oh. Oh, no, no, um, wait, wait. Oh, this one. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So this is a pair of normal lungs. Looking at it on FOSS, you're looking at the right side and the left side. The lung actually has five lobes. On the right side, it has three lobes. On the left side, it has two. So you can actually live without one or more of these lobes. You can't live without all of them, but you can live with only two or three of them. In the center <coughs> is the heart. And if you take away all the tissue around the lungs, it leaves you what we call the bronchial tree. The bronchial tree literally looks like a tree, a series of branching tubular structures that transmit air from the mouth, the nose, into the distal part or the distant parts of the lungs. We'll go in that corner. This is what I call the business end of the lungs. If you go back to your old high school biology, you may recall something called the alveoli. It looks like a cluster of grapes at the end of a tube, and it's surrounded by blood vessels. This is the business end. This is where gas exchange takes place. On a microscope, it looks like a thin, lacy pattern, very single layer of cells that allow the transmission of oxygen from the, from the alveoli into the blood vessels. And if you took a cartoon looking at the actual blood vessel and the alveoli, oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide comes out. So this is where the business takes place in respiration. <coughs> Again, how many of you have had a chest x-ray? <laughs> well, almost everybody here. Okay. So what I put up is a, a pair of lungs and to contrast with what we see on a chest x-ray. So you have the right lung, the left lung, and then you're looking at the chest x-ray. We'll start. The white structures, you can see all your bones. You can look at the clavicles, the top of the shoulder on the left, top of the shoulder on the right. You can see the humerus, part of the arm bone. Uh, you see your ribs. And you notice that the right on the bottom here is something we call the diaphragm, the, whole, the muscle of respiration. Just below the diaphragm is the liver. You don't see much on the liver on an x-ray. On the left side, you see the left diaphragm, and you see this little triangular structure in the middle here. That's the heart. That's how the heart appears on a chest x-ray. Up on top, you'll see a little black stripe, and it seems to branch over into the right, and then it branches again into the left. This is the windpipe, also known as the trachea. It transmits air into the right lung and then into the left lung. You'll see a little knob right adjacent here, just to the right of the trachea, my right, your left, okay? And what you see is, this is what we call the arch of the aorta. 
So the aorta is the big artery that comes out of the heart and takes blood filled with oxygen and helps pr uh, transmit it to the rest of the body. So you can get a lot of information from a chest x-ray if you know how to look at it. I'm sure Dr. Bright, after years of looking at chest x-rays, he's probably as good as a CT scan in many cases. <laughs> no? <laughs> um, uh, so this is what a chest x-ray does. Now, the, the thing about a chest x-ray, it's, it's radiation. Okay? So every time you have a chest x-ray, uh, I'll take, let me take a step back. When we're walking around, we're exposed to ionizing radiation every day. Uh, it could be just from the sunlight uh, the, and the various materials that are around us. An x-ray gives you the equivalent of roughly 7 to 10 days worth of radiation walking around. Okay? Much different from a CAT scan. A CAT scan can give you anywhere from 6 months to almost four years, depending on the type of CAT scan that one may take of radiation. Okay? So we, we have to be a little, we, we are a little bit too liberal sometimes in ordering CAT scans. This is a CAT scan. Now what is a CAT scan? Anybody know what a CAT scan? How many of you have had a CAT scan? I already saw at least one report here, right? So what is a CAT scan? Well, a CAT scan is like going to your deli and getting x-ray slices of your body. Okay? So if you think about the screen, your head is actually behind the screen, your feet are in front of it, and you're looking up at the ceiling. Okay? And what the CAT scan does is take serial x-ray pictures, we flip the slice over, and we're looking up into one's body. And this end up, what's on the left is actually the right side, and what's on the left is actually on the right side. And then each cut comes down a little bit lower. And it gives us a much clearer picture of the anatomy of what's going on. <coughs> when you do a CAT scan of the chest, you do two different views. They have two different levels of contrast, like changing the contrast on the old-fashioned TVs, making it more black or making it more white. On the top here, I have a series of views which demonstrate what I call the mediastinal views. Okay? These are views that help me look at the heart and the blood vessels in the center of the chest. On the bottom, I have the lung windows. This gives me a better picture of the lung tissue itself. If we go through the top, we talked a little bit about the windpipe and the aorta. And what we see here, this little black hole right in the center, that's at the level of the windpipe, just where it's about to branch into the left and right parts of the lung. We see it a little bit better here as we go down just a step lower and give a clear picture of the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus. And then you see it even clearer still here where it's proceeding on to right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus. The white circle you see here is called the ascending aorta. Okay, that's the big artery that's coming out of the heart to deliver oxygenated blood. On the back side, you see the descending aorta, because if it comes up, it's got to go down, okay? It goes down the back. And then you see this structure here is actually what we call the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery takes blood that's been spent of oxygen to bring the blood back to the lung so it can be reoxidated and delivered to the rest of the body. And then you see clear pictures. You see the ribs, the breastbone, the scapulae on either side. So it gives you a nice clear picture. So CAT scans are very good at giving you a clear, very clear picture of the anatomy. <coughs> On the lung windows, again, the analogous lung windows, what you see, the lung tissue is <coughs> these lines and marks. Now I show this picture to my patients, and the first thing is, without a little bit of knowledge, they get very worried about it. All those white marks look like they're abnormal. <coughs> those are all normal lung markings. The lung has blood vessels, the lung, lung, the lung has lymphatic channels, and they all show up these white streaks through the black markings of the lung. Okay? You have to get worried when I get worried about some of these markings. All right? But it's good to know that some of these markings are in fact perfectly normal. How do I test lung function? How do you test lung function? What do I ask you about? Do you get short of breath? Why do you get short of breath? Okay? I have to measure how well your lungs function. Dr. Bright was passing around something called a pulse oximeter a little while ago. A pulse, you know what, how many know what a pulse oximeter is? What is a pulse oximeter? It measures the amount of oxygen in your bloodstream. Right. I used to say it's like your mother. You, you get a cut, your mother would say, oh, your blood looks good, it's bright red. Well, it's basically measuring how red your blood is. That's what it does. <laughs> Okay? It shines two wavelengths of light through, 
And with the pulsatile action, it can actually differentiate the two. And with an algorithm, it tells you how much your blood is saturated with oxygen. A normal value is above 95%. Most of the time, we like to see uh, 97, 98%. Uh, but it, it gives you a good clue as to how well the blood is being oxygenated. Now what I can't carry around with me is what I call my pulmonary function test machines. Has anybody been, ever been given a peak flow meter? Now sometimes, anybody have children with asthma? Okay. Sometimes the kids with asthma will be given a peak flow meter. I give out my asthmatic a peak flow meter. It's a poor man's pulmonary function test. Has anybody ever tried blowing candles at a birthday party? Okay, so what a, what a peak flow meter is, it measures the velocity with which the air comes out. So the idea is you have to take a deep breath in, and then you blow it as hard and as fast as you can, and it tells me the velocity with which the air came out. Okay? These machines actually give me more precise numbers. There are two types of pulmonary function tests we may do. One, the most common one, would be on a desktop computer called a spirometer. Your doctors, your primary care physicians may have done it in the office with you, where we measure two things. How fast does the air come out and how much air came out? We could do it with a desktop spirometer, most commonly, or with something called a plethysmograph or a body box. Two different types, usually with a technician in the room to put you through your exercises. You say, oh, gee, a breathing test, that's pretty easy. Okay? But generally what we have to do, we actually put you through your rigors through these tests. You have a technician, they may do it four, five, or six times to make sure that the results are consistent and giving us an accurate picture of your lung function. So it's a good test may take upwards of 45 minutes to do. And like I said, we'll measure, we'll measure the velocity of the air, the amount of the air, and then we'll also measure something called diffusing capacity. How fast does that oxygen go from your lungs to your bloodstream? These are pulmonary function tests. On your left is what I call a flow volume curve. I'll walk you through this a little bit. On the bottom is a person breathing in, a maximum deep breath, and then what you do, you have the patient breathe out as hard and as fast as they can, and then you watch the air come out. So you take a deep breath in, and then blow it all the way up. <coughs> A good technician will have you blow out for at least six seconds. He'll keep on yelling at you to blow out, even though you felt all the air already came out. He's going to keep yelling at you before you get to breathe in again. This looks like a perfectly normal curve. Okay? And what you see is the air, the maximum velocity or the peak flow that you would measure in one of those little handheld devices. And then as the air, as the air empties out of the lungs, it slows down because there's less air in the lungs as it slows down. An abnormal curve would look very much scooped out, telling me that there's something slowing the air down. It's not coming out as fast as it should. And that's how I define something called obstructive lung disease. Other curves look very shrunken, very small, or restricted. And that's what we call restrictive lung disease. On the right, I put a, I put a graph I think was very interesting to look at. How old is the average, the average age in this audience is over 35. Agreed? Okay. It's all downhill after 35. I mean, this curve <laughs> proves it. Um, lung function declines with age at a very specific rate. And that's what this curve is showing. Okay? So we're looking at an average non-smoker. Lung function declines roughly about age 25 to 30. It starts declining over time. Emphysema is part of the aging process. I can take a 100-year-old man who, who breathed the purest air in Switzerland at the mountaintops and look at his lungs at an autopsy. He will have emphysema in his lungs. It's part of the aging process. The real the critical aspect of this is how quickly does one acquire it over time? And has, anything been doing to, has, any, has he done anything to speed it up? The number one thing we do to speed it up is tobacco use or cigarette smoking. Those who smoke tobacco lose their lung function at a much more rapid rate. Anybody know any smokers here? Come in. Okay. Here's the good news. If they can stop smoking, their lung function, although it will never catch up to a normal person, 
they'll start losing their lung function at a slower rate. So they won't lose their lung function as, as quick as they will if they continue to smoke. When your lung function starts falling below what I call an FEV1 of two liters, that's when people start getting symptomatic. That's when they start complaining about being short of breath. A normal, a normal number for an FEV1 or forced expiratory volume in one second, how much air came out in that first second of you breathing out hard and fast, if it's less than two liters, you get short of breath. A normal number should be around four or five liters. Okay, back to the common lung ailments. The number one is tobacco use, tobacco use related disorders. And it goes by the names of COPD and emphysema. How many have heard of COPD? So COPD is an umbrella term, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The classic diseases are three. <laughs> Bless you. One is asthma. Second one is emphysema. The third one is chronic bronchitis. Usually, it, usually you don't have a pure form of any one of these illnesses. There's usually an overlap of one or more of these illnesses. Asthma connotates that there's a reversibility. When you're well, you're normal. When you're an asthmatic and having an attack, you're abnormal. In between attacks, an asthmatic should be normal. An untreated asthmatic over time can become a chronic asthmatic, and that can put them in the realms of something called COPD. Chronic bronchitis, we go back to my first slide, I showed you that nice cartoon of the bronchial tree. Okay? Chronic bronchitis is a disease of the airways. The airways become thickened, uh, produce a lot of mucus, the patient does a lot of coughing. Emphysema is a disease of the alveoli, where the gas exchange units start withering away over time. So they're, they're actually different diseases, although they're all under the umbrella of obstructive lung disease. Infections. We've all had infections. The most common respiratory infections are viral in nature. So you're very commonly flu, for instance. Uh, there are bacterial infections. Again, very, very common. Many, if not all of us, have been on antibiotics at one time or another for a respiratory infection. Less common infections will go by the name of mycobacterial disease. Who knows what a mycobacterial disease might be? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Okay. Tuberculosis. Another common one is an atypical mycobacteria. We're diagnosing more and more. Go mycobacterium avium intracellulae or MAC, M-A-C. And that's an interesting disease because sometimes <coughs> treating it is worse than having it. Because the treatment involves four or five medications. So there's a little bit of an art and a discussion with the patient about when and if we really should treat it. Sometimes it's better having it than giving the medications. And then fungal infections. Fungal infections, although not as common in the United States, they're common in certain areas of the United States. There's something called histoplasmosis for those who may have come from the Midwest in the Ohio River Valley. There's another illness called coccidiomycosis, which comes from the Southwest in the desert, or called desert fever. And in fact, patients who actually come from these areas may have abnormalities on their CTs and on their x-rays that they've had for years. <coughs> and sometimes you just have to ask them, were you ever in the Ohio River Valley? And find out about it. Cancer. We all fear lung cancer. Most common cause of lung cancer is tobacco smoke. Lung cancer is described in two basic <coughs> varieties you have to know about. The most common one is called, uh, it's called large cell lung cancer or non-small cell lung cancer. That's the most common. A lesser common one is called small cell lung cancer. It's important to differentiate between the two because if it's non-small cell lung cancer, I'm going to look for a reason to operate, to cut it out. If it's small cell lung cancer, we're probably going to recommend things like chemotherapy and radiation therapy. It's an important differentiation. The unfortunate thing about lung cancer, the survival rates of lung cancer have not changed over many, many years. So we look for detecting it early. You may be reading about it when you see some advertisements on newspapers or in, on television ads now about newer agents, uh, immune agents that may help increase survival a little bit. There's also an epidemic that we discovered among the Asian 
young Asian women who get lung cancer, they have a specific genetic defect where we know by giving them certain immuno, uh, immunomodulators, we can actually prolong their survival for a good long time. The whole story is not completely told yet on lung cancer, but if someone has a non-small cell lung cancer, the thing I'm going to look for is what, whether or not I can do surgery for you. I won't do the surgery. You don't want me doing the surgery. I'll, I'll get somebody who can actually do the surgery for you. Cardiovascular disease. The lung, in the middle of the lung sits the heart. The heart, the heart affects the lung function. If someone has a bad heart and the heart gets large, it squeezes out the lung. If the heart doesn't function properly, can't pump the blood efficiently, fluid will back up into the lung and cause something called congestive heart failure or fluid on the lung. There's also an illness called pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now we all know that our blood pressure out here should be what? What level in the arm? You take a normal blood pressure. 120 over 70. That's what we're taught. What's the blood pressure in the lungs? We don't think of it that way. But the blood pressure in the lungs is about 15 to 20 over maybe 5, 0 to 5. So much lower. There are illnesses, though, where the pressure in the heart and the lungs actually gets elevated to the point where it starts causing problems. And that's called pulmonary arterial hypertension. Again, there's a whole litany of research going on in pulmonary arterial hypertension. <coughs> the most common cause of pulmonary arterial hypertension is actually problems with the heart and not with the lungs themselves. Genetics. There are genetic diseases associated with lung disease. Anybody hear of something called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is a defect in a certain enzyme called alpha-1 antitrypsin. It actually protects the lungs from stre oxidative stress, the stuff we breathe in, the air pollution and things of that nature, tobacco smoke. Persons with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can look at a pack of cigarettes and get emphysema in their 20s and 30s. We now have a replacement. We can actually give back alpha-1 antitrypsin through infusions in the patient's home to try to prevent them from developing emphysema over a long period of time. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is exquisitely rare. But if I see a young person who has emphysema at a very young age, I should look for it because I have a potential treatment. Cystic fibrosis. How many have not heard of cystic fibrosis? Almost everybody here has heard of cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is also a genetic disease. Cystic fibrosis causes an illness called bronchiectasis. And what is bronchiectasis? Bronchiectasis is a scarring of the airways of the lung. They become deformed because of recurrent infection of the airways. They're inflamed, they fill with mucus, fill with bacteria. Uh, and over, over a period of time, patients with cystic fibrosis will develop uh, pulmonary hypertension because of the airway diseases. They will develop hypoxia. They won't be able to get enough oxygen into their bloodstream. And because their airways are so deformed, they can't get the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out. And eventually, these kids will end up needing lung transplants or even heart lung transplants for their survival. We've come a long way with cystic fibrosis over the many years. And a lot of it has to be on the backs of the family members taking care of these kids through respiratory therapy techniques, inhaled antibiotics, and other, other regimens. You had a question? There are other um, reasons for bronchiectasis, though. There, bronchiectasis is sort of another one of these umbrella terms. So bronchiectasis can be localized. Someone could have a bad infection in childhood, a pneumonia as a child, and have bronchiectasis. Uh, there are congenital abnormalities where people, where persons are born with bronchiectasis of the airways. Uh, more commonly, uh, it, it's a result of either recurrent infections over a long period of time because of immunodeficiency states, not having enough gamma globulin in one's blood. There are rarer disorders. You know, you have little nose hairs. <coughs> other nose have little nose hairs. Those nose hairs are vital for actually sweeping debris, bacteria, and other things out of the airway. Those little hairs also exist in the lining of the lung. And if they're not working properly, you can be prone to recurrent infections. It's called ciliary dyskinesia. I'm sure you wanted to know that. But the point is, it can re result in, in, ab in infections in the lung and cause scarring of the airways over time. Uh, neuromuscular diseases. Uh, if, if to move air in and out, you have to move the, the ribs up and down. The diaphragms have to go up and down. 
And if you have a neuromuscular disease, you can't do that. And you go into what we call respiratory failure. You can't get the carbon dioxide that you're producing out fast enough. Polio is a good, good example of one. And actually, I was just telling uh, Dr. Bright, I have a woman who has a, a terrible neuromuscular disease over 30, 40 years, former nurse. She lives in Whitestone. And I've been taking care of her my entire career of 30 years since I was at Cornell. And now it's at the point where she can't get out of her house. And I did my first telehealth visit with her. Her nurse in the home with her. We, had, we Skyped back and forth. We went over her medications. She saw me. I saw her. I had a nurse do the vital signs, and it was nice. But she's been on a ventilator for the better part of the last 30 years. So, so neuromuscular disease, it actually has nothing to do with the lungs themselves, but it's the musculoskeletal system around the lungs. I have another patient who has severe uh, kyphoscoliosis. Now, we, everybody gets screened for kyphoscoliosis. The back's a little crooked. You know, I'm talking about someone who looks like a question mark. And this woman has it because she, has, she had had polio as a child and her body sort of contracted up into this question mark. And she's been on a ventilator for a long time as well. And it puts pressure on the lungs because you can't move the rib cage up and down. So you breathe very, very small breaths over time. And over years of doing that, it has its toll on the respiratory system. There was a Dr. Jeremiah Barrandes was one of my mentors <coughs> growing up. Cornell. You remember Jeremiah? So Jeremiah used to classify things into infectious diseases, malignant diseases, and one of them viral diseases. Jeremiah was trained at Johns Hopkins. Um, and what he was talking about were what we call the autoimmune or the collagen vascular diseases. So rheumatoid arthritis. Who's heard of rheumatoid arthritis? What does, what does rheumatoid arthritis affect? What part of the body? Most commonly, you say the hands, but it's actually a systemic illness. It actually can attack multiple organs. It can attack the eyes, it can attack the lungs, it can attack the heart. Okay? It's, it's, it's your body's defense is attacking itself, in, in essence. Uh, so you have autoimmune or cardiovascular <coughs> diseases. The common ones that affect the lungs are rheumatoid arthritis and something called scleroderma. So these can also cause problems with the lungs. All right, so those are the common lung ailments. Oh, I know this is the slide everybody's waiting for and wants to ask me about, okay? Um, the, this slide is, is the bane of my existence. <coughs> These are all the drugs that I can prescribe for lung disease, mainly for obstructive lung disease. These are all the inhalers. How many people have seen an inhaler or are actually on an inhaler now? Okay. <laughs> There's been an explosion in these inhalers. The trouble with these inhalers are a couple of things. One is that every company has its own brand. They're god-awfully expensive. Different insurance companies have different favorite ones they like, <coughs> which causes Mel, Mel is shaking his head. He knows. He knows the whole routine. Okay. Um, the other thing, too, is that the drug reps like to go to the doctor's <coughs> offices and give them the latest and greatest these inhalers to get you hooked on them. They so also happen to be the most expensive. And what I want to do, I thought I'd take some time to go through the different classes of inhalers here. What I can tell you, when I tell my patients, I am not married to a particular brand of inhaler. The one, that I, the one I like to prescribe is the one that your drug company will pay for for you so you can actually have it and use it. Because they're all variations of very, very similar, similar drugs. I'm going to start on the left. We have what is called relievers, or what I like to call are the rescue inhalers. They go by the name of ProAir. Uh, the generic name is called albuterol. These are short-acting, very quick-hit medications to relieve an acute asthma attack. So when you have acute wheezing, these are the medications that we rely upon. I tell my patients to keep this in their pocket, they carry it with them. I don't want them taking it all the time. However, I also use it as a marker. Because if they start taking that medication out more than two or three times a week, I know something has changed, and I need to do something else about their condition. On the bottom here, I have something called a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, or also known as an anticholinergic inhaler. There are two types of receptors in the airway. 
One is called a beta receptor, and one is called a cholinergic receptor. The beta receptor is where the short-acting beta agonists work. Now, beta agonists act like your own adrenaline. Okay? How many of you are on a drug called low press or metoprolol? Anybody here have a beta blocker? Okay? So we have beta blockers and beta agonists. So we have drugs that block the beta receptor, and you have drugs that enhance the beta receptor. Okay? So this is where the lung doctors and the cardiologists are at odds. Cardiologists like to block the beta receptors. Lung doctors like to stimulate the beta receptors. Okay? So we have, to, we have, we have a little bit of uh, budding heads we have to do sometimes. The, the muscarinic antagonists, or the anticholinergics, do not have as great effect on dilating the airways or opening up the airways as the beta as the beta drugs do. However, if you use it in conjunction with a beta agonist, the beta agonist drug, it seems to give you more bang for the buck of the both of them. Steroids. Steroids are probably the number one drug I prescribe, and probably the number one drug my patients fear the most. How many know how many would prefer not to take a steroid? Why not? What's wrong with steroids? Diabetes, All sorts of problems, right? They drive some of my patients crazy because they, they affect the, the, psych, the psyche. You know, you're, you're, you're hypermanic, you know, you're going around and you're yelling at your family members and all. Diabetes, blood sugar, blood pressure, weight gain. They're horrible drugs, okay? At the same time, they're horrible drugs. They're also my best drugs because so they actually fix things. They actually make people better. I have someone with a bad asthma attack or a bad COPD exacerbation. They'll feel better in a matter of a day or two on the steroids. But then, then you have to figure out how I get them off it so they don't get the side effects. Okay? When you think of steroids in that, in that sense, okay, I'm giving them to you either by mouth, by intravenous, or by a muscular injection into your body. And I'm using doses in the orders of what I call mil milligrams. What's a milligram? A thousandth of a gram. Okay? If I use steroids in an inhaler, you know what the dose of the steroid is? It's a microgram, a millionth of a gram. Okay? It's a ma it's two magnitudes order less than if I have to give you something by mouth or by vein. So if you had to be on steroids, wouldn't you rather get micrograms of stuff rather than milligrams of stuff? It seems to make sense. The other way I describe some of these inhaled steroids, if you had a rash and a dermatologist told you to put a cream on the skin to make the rash go away, would you think twice about it? Because odds are that cream it probably has a steroid in it. Okay? Very little gets into the circulation to cause all those fun side effects that you described. Okay? Same thing with the inhalers. Now, I'm not going to tell you that they're perfectly safe. There is an increasing body of literature that suggests there may be some subtle changes and pressures in the eyes associated with this. Okay? However, it pales in contrast if I have to keep on giving you doses of prednisone by mouth or by vein over a long period of time. So the inhaled steroids are a very, very good a friend of the lung doctor. They decrease inflammation in the airway and they de decrease your need of using some of these rescue medications. And then, then we make it complicated. We have something called long-acting bronchodilators. Long-acting bronchodilators. We talked about the short-acting bronchodilators, short-acting beta agonists. Now we have long-acting beta agonists, things you can take once and they last for a long time in your circulation. Okay? Great. If I, I mean, if, I have, if I'm taking beta agonists and I have to take them three or four times a day, I'd much rather take something once a day, right? It makes perfect sense. There is a small body of literature that suggests that taking the long-acting beta agonists has been associated with sudden death, sudden cardiac death. And the stories usually go, you find the patient either holding, clasping their inhaler, and they're cold stone dead. Okay? Now, there's a great debate. Offer. You know, the, the debate is, is it because of the breathing condition and the use of the medication that the patient died, or is it because the patient didn't get help soon enough when they were in trouble? What I can tell you is that in my practice, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Bright speak for himself, if someone is sick enough or using their short-acting beta agonist enough, okay, that I think I need to have a long-acting beta agonist on board, okay, 
I better be treating with a steroid at the same time. Because the data is not the same if I'm treating with a steroid. So I suspect that the studies where using the long-acting beta agonists were really failures of identifying people who are actually sicker than they were and not being on a steroid or an anti-inflammatory medication at the same time. But I would not prescribe a long-acting beta agonist without an inhaled steroid at the same time. We're now into the market of long-acting anticholinergic medications. So the short-acting anticholinergic medication is something, a drug called Atrovent. Short-acting, you have to take it two or three times a day. The, the major side effect you have to worry about is if you're a man. It can cause prostatism or urinary retention. Otherwise, if you don't spray it into your eye, you're okay. Long-acting anticholinergics are now on the market. They're getting a lot of press. Uh, Long-acting version. Most common one that I use is something called Spiriva. Anybody here for Spiriva? Okay, very common one. Uh, again, using these anticholinergics in combination with the beta agonists and the inhaled steroids to help relieve breathlessness and to relieve pe persons of the symptoms of COPD. And we're also seeing more and more combination inhales, things that combine the steroid with the long-acting beta agonist. Advair, Simbacort are two of the common brands. Uh, there's something out now called Brio, the Brio Elliptor. There are a whole host of them out now. None of these are, are more superior than any other. As I said before, the one that if, you, if, if your doctor wants to prescribe one of these to you, the best one for you is the one that's not going to bankrupt you. Okay? I want you to be on the one you can afford, the one that your insurance plan is going to cover. And this is the time of year. How many of you are re-enrolled in your Medicare Part D plans, right? Okay? Every year the formularies change. They'll cover drugs A, B, C. They won't cover drugs D, E, and F. Next year they'll cover D, E, and F, but then it won't cover A, B, and C. Okay? Okay? And unfortunately you're in a position of having to make very tough decisions sometimes. But I'm not, again, I'm not married, and you should not be married to a particular brand of these medications. The key components are the fact that it's an inhaled steroid and a long-acting beta agonist, okay? Uh, there may be some decisions to be made in the future. I'm told they're going to be making triple inhalers soon, where they have the long-acting beta agonist, the long-acting anticholinergic, and the steroid all in a single inhaler. I'm, I expect those to be on the market within the next year or so. They're already being used in Europe. And then medications we rarely use anymore uh, or go by the names of aminophilin. Mm -hmm. Mel, Mel remembers mixing the aminophilin drips when he was a kid doctor. I used to mix them too, and I don't think I'm as much a kid doctor as Mel was. Yeah. That's right. Aminophilin, Theodore, are, are very, we don't rely upon these medications. However, we may pull them out once in a while and have some efficacy. So that's the panoply of respiratory medications be very, very confusing for a patient because there are so many and you're being bombarded with advertisers on day in, day out. And you have doctors who've been, who are sort of being the puppets of the, some of the drug companies by pushing some of the fancier, newer medications. They're not pushing the older medications. They're pushing the new, expensive medications. Yes? Some question. You mentioned the US that's being used in Europe, the triple inhaler. Mm -hmm. How is that, um, that, is that a good inhaler? I mean, is it going to be FDA approved? It will be FDA approved. The, the system in the United States is much more, much more strict, right. stringent about getting things through. Right. Okay? Um, so the concept is great, especially for your patients who have to be on medications two or three times a day. If I can combine them into a single device, uh, I think that will be beneficial because it increases <coughs> compliance with the medications. The other thing that's happening, I didn't want to get into that much, uh, there's something called the, gold, the Global Obstructive Lung Disease Initiative. It's called GOLD. They had a set of recommendations that came out in about 2011, 2012. There's going to be GOLD 2017 coming out very, very shortly, which is going to give us guidance on how and when to use all these different types of medications. And actually, it's going to be much more personalized, not so much based upon breathing tests, but based upon patient <coughs> symptoms. So, uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that press coming out very shortly. I expect it sometime out in early 2017. How many got your flu vaccine? Uh, everybody in this room should raise their hand. And if you didn't, I want to know why you didn't get it. 
okay? Because there's really no reason not to get the flu vaccine, okay? No one wants to get the flu, okay? No matter how old you are, how young you are, okay? And especially if you're over the age of 65 and have any other medical illnesses, you need to get a flu vaccine. Getting the flu vaccine, yes, it's not going to guarantee 100% you won't get the flu. I promise that. However, if you do get the flu, okay, it's going to be shorter time span, won't be as severe, and you're not going to transmit it as much as somebody else if you don't get the vaccine. Okay? The flu vaccine changes every year. And it changes every year because the flu is smart, and it changes its antigens every year. And so smart scientists at the CDC in Atlanta predict what flu strain is coming around. Most of the time, they get it right. A couple of years ago, they got it wrong. Okay? But most of the time, they get it right. The best time to get the flu shot is usually between, I usually say between Halloween and Thanksgiving. And I say that because it takes about two weeks for you to have an antibody response. Flu season is just picking up in the New York area now. Uh, the New York State Commissioner of Health, at some point, and very shortly, he'll announce for what we call masks on. Okay, where if you're a hospital worker and have a legitimate reason for not having taken the flu shot, you have to wear a mask when you're at work in the hospital because that's how serious we're taking it. And in fact, I just got, just before I got here, uh, Mary Godfrey, one of the vice presidents at the hospital, notified me of one of my physicians under my charge who did not provide proof of having getting a flu shot. Okay, she is locked out of our computer systems right now. She cannot work until she proves that she's gotten, you like that, right, man? He loves it. <laughs> All right? Okay? She, she was asked, and she couldn't provide proof of having gotten the flu shot. We locked her out of work. She cannot work until she provides us proof of having a flu shot. Okay? Can the, can the flu shot give you the flu? Who's heard that myth? It cannot. It cannot. It's a dead virus. It doesn't give you the effect. Uh, but you could have an allergic reaction. You can have an allergic reaction, but it's exquisitely rare. It's more likely... More likely, what you're going to feel is your immune system kicking in, yeah. giving you a response to the flu shot. Okay, so it's not uncommon to get sore in the arm. Yeah. It's not uncommon to maybe have a small fever at night. Okay, some people it goes to the extreme where it gives them flu-like symptoms. Okay, however, that's your immune system kicking in and having a response. You're creating antibodies to the flu at that point. That's what that. That's what you're feeling. Okay, so I will tell you not to be fearful of the flu shot. Okay. My personal recommendation, because CVS, Walgreens, and Dwayne Reed are giving it out in August, I think that's too soon. There's no flu or very little flu around in August. And the last thing in the world I want you to do is think you're protected from the flu when come December your antibody levels are now going down because you got the flu shot back in August. Okay? That's my personal belief. Okay? There are other people out there who just want people to get vaccinated. I want you to get vaccinated properly. So I would advocate between Halloween and Thanksgiving are the best time. If you haven't gotten your flu shot, you still have time. The flu will be with us to the spring. So you still have time to get your flu shot. How many have had your pneumonia vaccine? How many understand pneumonia vaccine? It's very confusing. The recommendations have changed roughly about every five years or so. There are lots of different strains of, flu va of pneumonia vaccine. Uh, it started off as a, as a PS7, then it was a PS13, now we have a PS23, now we have Prevnar. It's gotten very confused. At one point, you only needed two injections over your lifetime. Another one, you had to get a booster every five years. The current state of thinking is that patients over the age of 65 or those with chronic medical illnesses need two pneumonia vaccines, about one year apart. And there are two ways. The preferred method is something called PS23 or Prevnar. It's a fancy, relatively new vaccine against 13 common strains of the pneumococcal bacteria. It's a, what I call a revved up virus. It gives you an enhanced immune response. Okay? It's also not recommended to take it together with a flu shot because actually it decreases the effectiveness of the pneumonia vaccine. So you have to take them separate by <coughs> days to weeks. Then the recommendation is to take a second injection of a pneumonia shot six to 12 months after the, after the Prevnar, a PS23, the standard pneumonia vaccine. 
Now, many of you had already been vaccinated with the PS23, the old-fashioned vaccine, before Prevnar even was the light in somebody's eyes. Okay? But the recommendation is if you've had the PS23, you should just get one injection of the new PS13 uh, at least 12 months after your last pneumonia vaccine. Okay? And that will protect you right now, the thought is, for the rest of your lifetime. Again, pneumococcal, is a, pneumococcal bacteria is the most common form of bacterial pneumonia. It also causes meningitis. It also causes ear infections. Doesn't guarantee you'll never get pneumonia, but it gives you a layer of protection against one of the most feared causes of pneumonia. And then if you do get the disease, it's going to be a much less of a burden to you than if you didn't have the vaccine to begin with. So I would strongly encourage you to talk to your doctors about getting the pneumococcal vaccine if you haven't gotten your vaccine. Yes, ma'am. The pneumococcal vaccine taken three, four years ago, five years ago, it's follow up with Prevnar now. Yes. Is that that's it. That, to, to the best we have know right now, that's adequate. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a whole bunch of smart people that get together every couple of years who go over all the vaccines that we give and administer, all right, and make recommendations. So these are, the, <coughs> these are the thought leaders in medicine and vaccination. That's the best information we have for you right now. So if you got the original one, you should get a Prevnar. You should get a Prevnar now, okay? You don't, and you don't need another 23 a year later. You're done. I think a lot of people get too many vaccines, all right, because they don't remember. And that's one of the beauties of our new electronic health record, keeping track of these things for you. Excuse me. And yes. if you are going to have some kind of reaction to the pneumonia shot, what is that going to be like? Pneumonia shot is going to be very similar to the flu shot. Now, the interesting thing about the pneumonia vaccine, it's not a protein. So it tends to not cause as many reactions as the flu shot. The flu shot is actually derived from a, uh, an egg yolk, back, uh, egg, yolk, egg yolk protein. And even, even those who have it, he's, he, yeah, he's a, he's a non-believer here. No, no, okay? actually, I, actually, it just gave me an excuse that just to take the day off, I would take it through the job. <laughs> 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 and, then, uh, and I would say, listen, I'm having a reaction, I'm taking the rest of the day off. So. The current recommendations, even for those who say they have an egg allergy, or okay, is the difference is don't take it to the pharmacy, go to your doctor's office, let them watch you for a couple hours after you take the shot, but not to not get it. With the pneumonia vaccine, the reactions are similar. Swollen, maybe a swelling in the injection site, some erythema, redness, warmth, maybe a low-grade fever the night of. Okay? Very unusual for it to cause a reaction greater than that. How many of you have ever heard of something called choosing wisely? Anybody? It's really sad. Okay? How many have heard of consumer reports? Okay. How about the American Board of Internal Medicine? So choose. <laughs> this is one of the good things they do, though. Now, okay. They, besides testing physicians, this is one of the good things they do. So Consumer Reports and the American Board of uh, Internal Medicine got together, and they asked all the specialty societies, what are the things that patients should question of their doctors? When should they ask, why do I need this? Why are you doing this test? So they went to all the different specialty societies and got recommendations. And this is a collaborative effort both to educate patients, but also to educate doctors and the primary care physicians about what tests they should be offering. Okay? I sat in a lecture with Dr. David Blumenthal. Dr. David Blumenthal is now president of the Commonwealth Fund. And he gives a little lecture. He starts out like this. He's got a 48-year-old neighbor, jock runs 10 to 15 miles a day, goes to his cardiologist, okay? Cardiologist orders a stress test. Why is he ordering a stress test? Guy runs 10 to 15 miles a day. He doesn't need it. So you take a history, you know the guy's running 10 to 15 miles a day. He's not getting short of breath, doesn't have chest pain. He doesn't need a stress test. So why would you get a stress test, okay? So what, what Consumer Reports and the American Board of Internal Medicine are part of going to each specialty society and say, gee, what do you think your doctors should not order or should not recommend in certain situations? That's what choosing wisely is. The bad thing about choosing wisely is it really hasn't gotten the public pressed and it really should. And you should also be smart, educated consumers of healthcare. Because I have a lot of things I can offer you. Not all of it will be correct for you, 
And if you have questions about it, you should not be fearful about asking these questions. And I'm hoping by giving this talk today, I've educated you a little bit on questions you may want to ask of some of your physicians. Is, is that a website or is that a... You can get it on the web. It's called choosingwisely.org is the website. Okay? Um, so things providers and patients should question, and more than 70 specialty societies have participated. And so from the American College of Chest Physicians and the American Thoracic Society, there are two things they ask you to question. <coughs> One is CAT scans to find lung cancer in smokers. So this has got a lot of press, the CT screening for lung cancer. Okay? It's a low-dose CAT scan. A low-dose CAT scan gives you six months of radiation in, one, in about five minutes. Okay? So it doesn't give you as much of a full CAT scan. A regular CAT scan gives you 12 months of radiation. Okay? There was a large study, the early lung cancer detection trial, looking to see if we make a difference by trying to detect lung cancer early. Okay? What we found, the results of that study showed a small benefit <coughs> for those patients who smoke more than 15 pack years. That means more than one pack a day for 15 years in a row and had quit less than 15 years ago, over the age of 55 and not more than the age of 80. They found that these CT scans provided a small benefit in detecting lung cancer early. Okay? But at what cost? At what cost was screening hundreds of other people or thousands of other people who didn't have the same <coughs> risk factors? And what did the CAT scans uncover? They uncovered stuff that we can't explain. Your nodule, for example. <coughs> Okay, um, Just from breathing the good New York air, having had an infection from years ago, having been in the military service, traveled overseas, you may have been exposed to something that caused you no problem, no bother. But because I did a CAT scan, I found something on your x-ray that I can't explain. And I can't, I can't prove it to you. It's not large enough for me to say, ha-ha, I should do a biopsy. I don't want to put you through that risk. Okay? But it's still there, and I have to, I have to do something about it and make sure, assure you that it's not going to be something more serious. So what do I have to do? I have to recommend another CAT scan, usually in a period of time, six to 12 months later. Sometimes something may be more suspicious, or may say three months later. Okay? So CAT scans can be get more CAT scans for no good reason and subject you to doing tests that you probably wouldn't have had if you hadn't done the CAT scan in the first place. Okay? So if your doctor is asking you to do a CAT scan, feel free to ask him why does he want you to have a CAT scan. Okay? The benefit for those over age 55 who are those 15-year smokers, you know, it's small, but it's clearly there. But if you're not in that category, the odds of that CAT scan catching a cancer that we can do something about is very, very small. Some people have pneumonia or respiratory infection and get hospitalized. They get put on oxygen, okay, and then we forget about it. You go home on oxygen and no one tells you to ever take it off again, okay? At some point, we should retest you to make sure that you do, do you really need the oxygen. Oxygen has been shown in several studies to improve survival in patients with COPD who have hypoxia. And what I mean by that is that their oxygen level is less than 55 or in a little pulse oximeter chronically runs less than 88% at rest. Then I know if you wear it for 18 hours a day, it will improve your survival. If you're not going to wear it 18 hours a day and your oxygen saturation is more than 88% at rest, it's not going to help you. It's just going to drain your wallet. It doesn't help. Okay? So doctors should be in the business of retesting patients who can put on oxygen to see when we can get them off oxygen. Oxygen can be too much of a good thing. When you mix iron and oxygen, what do you get? Rust. Rust. Okay? So oxygen can be too much of a good thing. All right? You can walk around very safely, comfortably, with oxygen levels as low as 90%. Okay? So getting on oxygen for anything, uh, anything above 88% is not useful for you. And then finally, happy Hanukkah to everybody. Okay? <laughs> and I was cautioned by my may you always have enough earth to blow out the Hanukkah candles, but don't blow them out since my rabbi Mel Bright says it's an old sore. <laughs> uh, happy, healthy, safe holiday season to you and your family. Thank you very much.